uh, get going here and introduce our speaker. Uh, and welcome uh, Mr. Doug O'Connor, who is a saxophonist, um, uh, currently completing his DMA at the Eastman School of Music. And um, Doug has won numerous awards and prizes and was the soprano saxophonist in the Red Lion Sax Quartet. Um, Doug has far too many accolades for me to mention here, but um, you can find uh, all about Doug at his website, www.dougoconnor.com. Uh, without any further ado, I want to turn it over to Doug and uh, welcome him and his uh, presentation tonight. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, it's an honor for me to do this webinar. I should say I've never done one of these before, and I'm uh, very excited. All the technology is very cool. Uh, the title of this webinar is Building a Chamber Group from the Ground Up, uh, the Red Line Saxophone Quartet Story. That title is courtesy of Steve Danu. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, well, basically, <laughs> there are several interesting things about our story and, and about getting invited to do this talk. Uh, so let's go to an overview of what I hope to accomplish in this little presentation. But the main beef of, I hope, of what I hope will be uh, discussed today will be during the question and answer and discussion. I uh, certainly invited some friends of mine who I think could weigh in and share a lot of interesting factoids themselves about life and chamber music. So um, you may not be familiar with Redline Sax Quartet. So the first thing I'll do is, of course, introduce the group and uh, what we've done and why there's any attention given on this group at all. Uh, that involves our successes, our failures, uh, a chronology or a narrative account of our story. That'll be the book, because in, in addition to sort of the lessons learned and things that I would wish to impart to other budding chamber ensembles or, or people who are curious and have questions about my experience, there's, there's just sort of, um, you, you know, to get an idea of what happened when. Uh, where we took care of certain things and what it looked like uh, to go along with the, the red line sort of chronology. Um, I'll talk about some conclusions that I've tried to make in mulling this over since Steve asked me to make this presentation. Uh, effective strategies and red flags, signs that things are wrong or that, uh, that things might not turn out okay. You know? uh, and finally, the impact that Redline had is not necessarily uh, what, in my opinion, is perceived uh, as it is now. So I'll leave that cryptically hanging there until the end. So let's talk about Redline Sax Quartet. Who are they? Um, I'm the guy on top. Uh, my name is Doug O'Connor. I grew up in Maryland. I'm a doctoral student. This is class of 2011. I first came here in 2006 to Eastman School of Music. Uh, and uh, that was for my master's degree, and up at the end of my fifth year, at end of my doctorate degree here. Uh, the other three students, Brandon Keyes, Guy Chun, and Quinn Lewis, these are all really talented uh, saxophonists in the studio of Chen Quan Lin. That's how we all know each other. And they all were in the graduating class of 2010 for their undergraduate. Um, so that's who these guys are and who we are as a group. Um, Probably we're most well known today for performing programs from memory. This is sort of uh, a signature move of Chen Quan Lin and his saxophone studio. Um, Dr. Chen Quan Lin is a really uh, amazing and singular saxophonist and actually grew up as a violinist. And that's one of the things that makes him interesting uh, as a performer on the saxophone. He plays everything by memory as hard as it gets and he's sort of inspired his students to do the same thing. In terms of chamber music, that creates a really engaging experience. There's no music stands uh, between the audience and the performers, or between the performers and themselves. So there's a lot of communication that sort of happens, and uh, that makes for these unique, uh, exciting chamber concerts. So that was our signature as a quartet, although we certainly haven't been the first to do that, and we'll talk more about that. So, who cares? <laughs> there are a lot of saxophone quartets out there. Uh, the thing that makes Redline sort of in the news today is the number of competition wins that we had. The effect of that was really huge. Uh, winning a competition gets a lot of press, and we won a lot of them. So there are six primary ones, and they're listed here. Uh, the Fish Off uh, win division, Chesapeake Grand Prize, probably our, our greatest triumph. 
uh, Plowman, Coleman, Music Teachers National Association, and North American Saxophone Alliance. That's not National Aeronautics Space Administration. <laughs> it's, it's a saxophone thing, that NASA thing that you see there. Um, in addition, we also were active as outreach artists. Um, I certainly had a very active outreach career through astral artists in Philadelphia, through their auspices. And um, sort of by way of that relationship, we were performing in Philadelphia as well. Uh, schools, non-traditional venues, retirement homes, community centers, things of that nature. People who wouldn't ordinarily get out the door to hear a saxophone quartet, or who might not be able to. Um, we also released a CD. It's called Backburner, titled after Frank Tichelli's popular uh, six-minute saxophone quartet showpiece. Um, and one of the things that I'm very proud of about the CD is it features the first North American recording of David Mislanka's recitation book, his second saxophone quartet. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that composer, I would encourage you to check him out. He writes some very colorful uh, and epic saxophone music. And uh, Redline was also engaged in the performance of new works. So uh, in particular, in addition to the pieces that we played of our fellow composers at Eastman School from time to time, we were sort of the, uh, the fulcrum of a project called Powered Line in Brooklyn, New York at the Issue Project Room, where we gave a concert of five new works for sax quartet and electronics. So that pretty much sums up what we've done in two and a half years uh, being together. Now, here's the issue. Uh, Redline no longer plays together. So this really puts a twist on who cares about what we did. When the title of a webinar like this says, building a chamber music group from the ground up, or basically how to succeed as a chamber music group, what's ironic here is that, by definition, Redline Sax Quartet has not succeeded in uh, the larger sense. We did not manage to stay together or to fulfill our promise as a group. And unfortunately, this is the way that most quartets go. Um, even if they're uh, good for a while, it's sort of a flash in the pan. It's really, really hard to keep a group together. So I'm hoping that our experiences um, uh, related to you through me will help others, of, uh, others out there to avoid similar problems and to actually stay together and have long, successful, uh, happy careers as a quartet. And one of the things I'll talk about at the end is what defines success in a quartet. I, I really think uh, that's not as simple as winning competitions or, or even having a performing career. So um, to come back to all that, that's sort of to set the stage, let's talk about the narrative, uh, how Redline began, uh, what things looked like in the beginning, and how a group like that starts and... Um, takes a path to, to doing all those competition wins and those such things. We began in the 2007 and 2008 academic year. Like I said, we're all students at the Eastman School of Music, and I was a second year master's student at the time. The other guys were sophomores in Chen Kwan's studio. Um, believe it or not, the first name of this group is Ignis Fatuous Saxophone Quartet, uh, which Ignis Fatuous is Latin for will-o'-the-wisp, this sort of phosphorus uh, essence that appears over swamps in, in places like Michigan. Uh, I coached the group as a master student for a semester, in addition to several other groups. That was my job at the Eastman School of Music. And uh, then one of the members of the group had to uh, leave. He, he, he ran into some trouble with his academics and, and decided to make a priority call and leave the group. So it left something open. And uh, while they were advancing at certain regional competitions and things, I took that, the place of that person. So this is a really important dynamic in uh, how the red line thing starts and, and will have an effect on the kinds of advantages and disadvantages we would have in the years to come. We have a situation here where there's a, a clear leader, someone who's a senior member um, or a teacher, in fact, a coach that joins the group. And, uh, that's a very unusual situation, although it does happen from time to time. And if you go to other competitions like Fish Off, you'll see other groups like this. So I'll talk about the problems and, and uh, pros and cons of that particular leadership setup. Um, our early goals. I think this is the most important thing. When you, when you first join a group, what does everybody want to do? 
uh, what is everyone thinking about and why be in a group? The first answer to this is you have to be in a group at the Eastman School of Music uh, if you're an undergraduate for a chamber music credit. So you get placed into one, and not even according to your skill level per se, it's, it's just according to your year uh, or your graduating class. So like I said, this was the sophomore graduating class. Um, so our first goal was to compete in and win a prize at any competition. This is just something that we wanted to do. A competition is a very tangible, uh, concrete, uh, easily centered goal. And, um, and that, that's, that's a very quick sort of impetus to get out of the gate. We also happens to want to become a career ensemble. We all really enjoy listening to saxophone quartet CDs. Um, we dreamed of this. You know, we, we, we went to bed at night thinking how great it would be to sort of tour the world and, and play uh, awesome saxophone music and, um, and, and to do it in a way that we weren't seeing done very often, which is by memory and with a, a lot of sort of visual cachet and appeal. Uh, and that leads to the next thing, memorizing a competition program. That was our first goal, and this is a very difficult thing to do. Um, a more logistical goal is to meet for 10 or 12 hours a week. Uh, we decided to to come up with that kind of a schedule first, to clear that kind of a commitment in all of our lives, and then to figure out what to do with it. I think that's a really important uh, difference here. Rather than sort of meet and decide how much time we needed for a particular piece, uh, we sort of gave it the most time we could or said to ourselves, well, this is the amount of time that these other groups out there are putting into the music. We need to do the same or more. Um, and uh, <laughs> believe me, you could always use more time. Uh, we wanted to become well acquainted with standard repertoire. There's tons of pieces that are out there, famous saxophone quartets that you would never play unless you're in an ensemble. And not everyone gets to be a part of the saxophone quartet that's serious enough to get through a lot of that stuff and do it at a high level. So this was a real big goal for us, to become familiar with a lot of the, the French standards, the sort of new works coming out, um, you know, similar to what you would do on your instrument as a soloist. And finally, we wanted to follow up on our predecessors, the Vim Saxophone Quartet, which no longer plays together uh, as well. They were a generation before us, uh, one of Chen Quan's first batch of students. And they, uh, they were the first group that I know of to play competitions and programs completely from memory. So um, we, we definitely had inspiration in that regard. Uh, let's talk about some things that really worked well for us. Our name. Uh, this is a biggie. And I totally underestimated how important this would become down the road when we were naming ourselves. I mean, yeah, you want to have a name that you like. But um, there are lots of sort of pitfalls that we accidentally avoided. Um, remember, our first name was this really convoluted, uh, hilarious Latin thing uh, that appealed to us. <laughs> but it's, it's a very uh, sort of college inside joke type of name. Uh, the name Redline Sax Quartet is sticky, to quote Malcolm Gladwell. It's visually evocative. Uh, by sticky, I mean it, it, it sort of it sticks to your mind. You remember the name easily uh, for various reasons. And the fact that it evokes something visual uh, is an important part of that. And that also makes it easy to market. We have a color scheme right off the bat. Uh, we have you know, anything you'd need to design a, a press package or a poster uh, that's cohesive all the way down to our name. Uh, the other aspect of it, there were things like uh, allusions to redlining a vehicle, putting things in overdrive, a, a sort of a high octane uh, group, or four guys, young guys. Um, that all sort of factored into it. Uh, the name is generic. The red line doesn't really mean anything. Uh, and that's a huge advantage. It won't box us in. Um, it evokes specific imagery, yet it, you know, it's, it's not like we're the traditional sax quartet or the, the classic sax quartet, which it kind of gives connotations that might limit the kind of repertoire we might do or, or how people might perceive us. Uh, red line does none of that. And the fact that it's generic means it's easy to say easy to remember. Um, no one has to wonder what it means or how to pronounce it. So you can see an example here, uh, hopefully the slides are showing okay, of a graphic that our baritone player's mother, who's a graphic designer, designed for us. This ended up on our business card and ended up being our logo. So um, like I said, very easy marketing, all coming from the name, 
creates a powerful, compact image package that sticks in people's heads. They remember us, and it's, um, uh, I would say, what you name your group is hugely important for the kind of things that you'll have to deal with later in terms of marketing. Um, also things that worked. We had a really nice situation at the Eastman School of Music. Access to some of the best chamber coaches in the country. I mean, really fabulous teachers here. Supportive faculty in school culture. We were uh, regularly funded through professional development grants at the Eastman School of Music. We owe a lot to that. That really helped defray the costs of competing and traveling and doing the projects that we were doing. There were opportunities for performance here at Eastman. It's all extremely important. In fact, um, at a, a conservatory like Eastman, I'd say a chamber music group uh, is about the closest thing uh, to a sports team in terms of school spirit and groups that people rally behind. So the kind of support that we had from our community was nothing short of tremendous from students, faculty. Um, all of us live in the same city by virtue of going to school together. Uh, this is not something that can be taken for granted, as I found uh, in, in the real world. And that's a, a major, major advantage while you're in school. So um, to any of those out there who are in school and starting a chamber music group, I highly recommend that you capitalize and move as fast as you can while you have this tremendous advantage. Clear leadership. Um, I, I briefly mentioned this before. In, in our case, the fact that I was sort of the, the teacher coming into the group, I had, I had the luxury of being an unequivocal clear leader, of being able to say, OK, we should do this, um, tune this there, tune that there. And uh, that's not a luxury that everyone has. Even if you're leading your peers, which is much harder to do, you're all in the same uh, grade, on the same level, same sort of social hierarchy in school, what have you, uh, there still has to be clear leadership. And it can be divided. It can be someone clearly leads uh, what's going on with certain aspects of music. Someone clearly leads logistics. But a common problem in chamber music groups is you get together to rehearse, and you all sit there and wait for somebody to pick up the ball and move. And um, a lot of groups have a lot of trouble getting over this. There always has to be one or more people um, initiating and catalyzing action. And finally, desire from all four members. This is something that really worked well for us. We were all passionate. We were all super excited to go into chamber music. And we really believed in ourselves and our situation. We knew that with the kind of time that we had blocked out, that we could achieve a lot. We were just like I said, very excited and, and very much in love with the kind of music that we were going to get to play. Um, we had a very ambitious vision. We were going for a strong visual appeal in addition to the music. We had a uniform, uh, exactly the same red shirts. This is important. Uh, we didn't just all pick red shirts uh, of slightly different cuts, textures, and, and shades. Uh, this was really hard, believe it or not. It took us an entire day, three different malls, several different department stores at each mall, to find the same kind of shirt that would fit all four of us. So like I said, our name made the choice easy. It's not like we had to wonder uh, about what color to choose, what style, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this is something that's really important because it's, it shows that we pay attention to little details and that we have a, a sort of unity and intensity, to quote uh, John, uh, Dr. Jonathan Dunsby. Um, eventually, we had some really good photos, uh, which were taken by Jerry Szymanski here in town a logo, a website, uh, these are things we wanted to have, made a big difference. Performing from memory and having a unique signature. There are a lot of saxophone groups out there, and there are a lot of saxophone groups out there who have won the fish off and, and done the things that we didn't even know we could do. But this was something that we could do uh, that was different, um, or at least somewhat unique. Even though the Vim Quartet had done it before us, we could be one of the few others to sort of do something like that. And we had our own ideas about music and programming and repertoire. So um, one of the things I, I definitely recommend is search for a way to be different in, in a good way, to do something different, um, have a unique signature. We videotaped our rehearsals. Uh, we really acutely addressed posture, spacing, minor choreography. Uh, you know, we didn't want to like, explicitly choreograph anything so as to be cheesy. But uh, we paid a lot of attention to how we look how our neck straps worked with our collars. Um, you, you know, the, 
the sort of symmetry of the way we stood on stage. Believe it or not, it's, it's pretty hard not to sort of wander around and, and look kind of off kilter when you don't have music stands and chairs rooting you. So um, paying attention to the way we look and our image, professional, um, both on and off stage, was a big part of what made this group work. Um, looks like I have a double slide here. Okay, there we go. Planning a future that we could all be excited about. This is probably the most important part. It goes back to what I was talking about with desire. If someone in the group, in any group, doesn't really want to do all these things, I mean, you're about to invest an incredible amount of effort and time and go through a lot of obstacles and hurdles, and these things will all be easy and fun, uh, relatively speaking, if you have that desire. If you have a future, a vision in mind, that all four of you can sort of uh, get excited about. Because then that breeds uh, love for each other, too. I mean, you, um, you get along, best of friends, you're all part of a team. Things start to get difficult once everybody wants a different thing in their future or their life. Or if you, we discover that the future of where we're headed doesn't look as exciting as it once did. So that's something we'll come back to. Things that almost works in our early stages. Integrity, or building self-respect as an ensemble. Starting rehearsals at an agreed upon time. Um, we all know what it's like if you're in an ensemble where there's no authoritarian uh, 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 coming down on you. If someone shows up five minutes late and then, you know, after a while it's ten minutes late, uh, then you start to think, well, I can show up a little late too. This is the degradation of your own self-respect as an ensemble. And it happens in little details, like showing up just a little bit late. And it's devastating over the long term. We were pretty good about it. It was an uphill battle. We, we stayed afloat. We, we started our rehearsals pretty well on time most of the time. Um, things like job delegation, uh, calendar maintenance, there's lots of logistical things to take care of in a saxophone quartet or any ensemble. And we were pretty good about it. But this is something that I coached all of my students when I was the uh, undergraduate saxophone quartet coach, is that if you operate well, you will play well, inevitably. Uh, meaning if you show up on time, if you manage your booking, booking rooms, getting your calendar all set, it's all the dry business logistical details that will set you up for success. Meet for 10 to 12 hours a week. Um, it'll be hard not to sound good if you are able to operate successfully on that level. So that was sort of our mantra. And, uh, at first, it was, it was sort of um, a little bit tricky. Um, of course, obviously, we were able to succeed with it to a pretty high degree eventually. Um, ideas and promises come pretty easy, and action doesn't. This is an important thing, matching actions to words in an ensemble. It also detracts from self-respect. If we say, okay, let's, let's all do this. Let's memorize uh, this whole movement for tomorrow's rehearsal. And if it doesn't quite happen, well, you've just planted one example, one seed of saying something and then not doing it. What you want to have in your ensemble is when you say something, you know it's going to happen. When you say to each other, okay, we're going to meet at this time, or we're going to do this, you believe everyone else is going to do it, and so you don't want to be the guy that doesn't. Um, that's really important, too. Uh, yeah, so this is what I just talked about. Agreeing to memorize music at home, for example, only works if you actually deliver on those memorization goals. Things that didn't work. At first, we tried to memorize our music during rehearsals. That was a problem. First of all, you have extremely poor retention uh, because you're sort of attacking it. You're playing things wrong more often than you're playing them right. Um, in addition, people memorize at different rates and different speeds, and this sort of exacerbates the differences in, in talent and ability that any group is going to have. Um, four players aren't all going to have the same strengths and weaknesses, and um, like a good coach of a football team or something, uh, any ensemble wants to put uh, their players in a position to succeed. Uh, give them opportunities to do exactly what they're good at. Um, so, for example, I might want more time to memorize something at home, and that might be a lower pressure situation. I might be able to get a lot more done that way. So memorizing music in rehearsal, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, setting rehearsal goals too large. Uh, this was, in our case, mostly for memory work at home. If they're too large, then they end up not getting done, and like I said, you lose self-respect as a group. Um, our repertoire didn't quite work. We didn't have any heavy-hitting repertoire for our first season. We played a lot of standards, things that were easily accessible to us that weren't too difficult to get a handle on. Um, but we didn't have anything to sort of bring up in a concert program or a competition uh, 
and this is, by the way, a constant difficulty for wind chamber groups, but when you're in a competition and other people are playing Beethoven, uh, Brahms, or you name it, works of sublime uh, human depth, uh, magnitude, epic qualities, it's really hard to sort of stand up against that with uh, light-hearted show music, you know, uh, and only that. Those things certainly serve their function, but our repertoire was definitely underdeveloped at this time, and it didn't work uh, the way it needed to. And performing from memory, believe it or not, was very scary and a very, very stressful situation, especially at first. Um, we did it. We held ourselves to do it. But um, there were a few times where we sort of bailed out of it. Um, our first year in the Fischoff was an example. And um, so I don't want anyone to, to think that we're just naturally gifted at performing from memory. This took an incredible amount of work. It took a lot of time to get used to it, to sort of work those muscles uh, together and, and begin to feel secure with that. I'd say it was a full year before we were securely playing anything uh, from memory and, and not feeling like anything would train wreck. Uh, our first competitions, we went to the Plowman in 2008 and the Fish Off, and we received recognition. We didn't walk away with any prizes, but we did walk away with some recognition, so that was uh, some nice affirmation for a young group. We had been together a couple months at the time, was how long I had been playing with them. Um, but the most important thing is we were exposed. We, we watched other groups intently, how they behaved on and off stage, how they played, uh, some very inspiring things. We learned what we wanted to emulate, what we wanted to avoid. Um, we were exposed to top groups' performances, like the Jasper String Quartet. Man, our, our first year, they, they delivered the most powerful performances, some of them that I've ever seen in chamber music. They did Bartok's fourth string quartet, and uh, I believe it was a, a Beethoven on top of that. I forget which one, but, oh no, it was Schubert, Death in the Maiden String Quartet. And this, you know, you look at that kind of repertoire with a top group that's now really making it big in the classical music world, that, um, that's an inspiring thing to be a young group and to see that happening. We we're also exposed to sort of an uncomfortable chasm between the quality of the wind versus the string chamber ensemble performances. Um, even, you know, some of the winning winds groups were not holding a candle to groups like Jasper or the new trio uh, from Juilliard. The, the level here was, was just so high and we began to wonder how on earth are we ever going to get there. And that seed of wondering was something that would motivate a lot of our decisions for the next few years. Um, I'm going to share with you something about the judges' comments we got in the first year, because I think it reveals something about priorities. We got very little comment on musical issues, although, believe me, there were plenty of them from all four of us. Um, and that was kind of curious. And the judges were certainly you know, very attentive and, and well-respected musicians. The comments focused on staging balance issues, look and feel, overall effect. So it's to show you that a lot of the things that we spend hours and hours stressing or fighting about in rehearsal that are musical issues might not be nearly as effective or as important as doing something like making sure um, you, you turn out when you have a solo to the audience so that they can hear you, um, or that you uh, have sort of a sense of confidence. Little details like that make a giant difference. Um, the other thing we noticed, as I just mentioned, is a vast difference in the repertoire between us and other competitors. Other competitors, saxophone quartets and other groups, were bringing in um, a variety of pieces, usually something very contemporary that was very flashy, could do a lot of things we couldn't do at the time, uh, like slapping, and circular breathing, or you name it, but also had a degree of, of epic weight, very, very large pieces of music. Um, so that's our first season together, and that sort of sets the stage for our ambition and what we're going to do in the next season, which is where we break out, win our first competition, and, um, and begin to get moving, get really exciting things rolling. So our new goals were to reinvent our repertoire, bigger, better, and more badass. This was a really important thing. So we chose um, works by Ms. Lanka and Gakovsky that were large. They were over 20 minutes. and um, we, we stuck with the things from our old program. I think we only stuck with one piece, actually, which is Frank to Kelly's back burner. Uh, we wanted to win a competition, a competition against a string ensemble. It was a pretty lofty goal, uh, and we didn't achieve it that year. Uh, we wanted to compete and perform from memory with security. Eventually, we were able to do this. That's a, a big one for our second year together. Uh, we wanted to build a website, get our, our marketing going, 
general online presence, start treating ourselves like a professional ensemble, and giving ourselves a rolling start, a chance for a career after school. And finally, um, the, the initial situation with myself coming in as a clear teacher, leader figure, was not going to be sustainable. We're moving towards a point where we want to be uh, a true uh, quartet, 25% role for everybody. And in order to do that, leadership needed to be divided, watered down away from me, um, uh, initiative roles. So we, we really struggled to um, sort of bridge that gap, sort of treat everybody, uh, it, you know, to have everyone feel like they were as much in control and in, in ownership of what happened to the group as someone who's in a leadership position. Um, it, it was easy for me to, to sort of stress if something wasn't going to happen or an application wouldn't get turned in on time, maybe, or if, if, uh, if you're rushing something and you don't know if the computer will crash and with all your videos and files on it that you need for a, a CD, then, um, you know, if you're in a leadership position, you're going to worry about those things. And if you're trusting someone else who's in a leadership position, you're going to worry less about them. So uh, that division of leadership was a big thing and we, uh, were, we were still working on it at the end of our third year. Uh, we achieved our first competitive victories in this year. Those were the Music Teachers National Association and Fish Off competitions. We received first prizes at both. Uh, when you do that, you, you get instant credibility in the chamber music world just by winning one competition. Uh, by credibility, I mean that you establish yourself as a serious group. People talk, people know who wins these things, and um, suddenly you've gone from potential to promise. This is a very important thing in terms of image and developing hype uh, and excitement, which is what I think we need in order to build audiences and get people to come to your concerts. We need hype. We need excitement. We need people to, to feel like they're a part of the next big thing when they come to your concert. And uh, winning a competition is a really quick and sort of instantaneous way to generate a lot of energy. You send out an email to all of your supporters and friends. The instant it happens, you keep them in the loop beforehand. and um, and that's what we were doing. We were sending out uh, newsletters for Redline, and people felt involved in our successes, and this was a really Im important thing. Um, I should also mention that competitions aren't the only way to establish credibility, but they're just effective because they're so fast. Once you win, you have a lot of sort of explosive power that you can capitalize on from a marketing angle. Also that year, after winning the fish off, we recorded a CD. Uh, although it took a while to take it to release, we, we got the work done, and um, in that sense, before we left for summer break, we could sort of chronicle or, or document the thousands of hours of work that we had all put into this music. Um, next slide. Business issues. We're starting to earn a little bit of income through gigs, through the University of Rochester, through competitions. We need to decide uh, what to do with the money and how to split it and things like that. And in addition, uh, to be paid as an ensemble and to clear up messy tax issues, we, uh, we got ourselves an employee ID number, which is quick, takes five minutes on the internet from the IRS, and a business banking account. Uh, with finances, we needed an incentive for everyone to go out and get gigs. Uh, we needed an incentive also to invest in the future of the ensemble so that we're not just paying ourselves and, and then Redline has no potential longevity for the future. Uh, we also needed to simultaneously reward individuals satisfyingly. So um, th this was often a problem. Say you win $2,000 as an ensemble. Um, everyone's hoping to sort of get, uh, you know, 500 of that to, to pocket to go home and, and take a vacation or something. But at the same time, as a group, you want to record a CD or you want to uh, fund a tour or you want to fund your travel expenses for the next competition. So does all that money get reinvested? Does all of it uh, go paid into individuals' pockets? How do we do that? So I'll share with you our solution was to divide income five ways. We have four members. Uh, each person gets one of those five parts. And the fifth part uh, just goes into the, the pot, just goes into the red line account. It belongs to no one individually. It belongs to the business. Or if someone specifically procured a gig, that's sort of a, a finding fee. So um, that was our incentive, and th I think this was a nice solution for us. First taste of career life. We just won a couple big competitions, feeling pretty good about ourselves, and our tenor saxophonist, Guy Chun, had arranged a, uh, a really exciting tour of China for us, which happened to coincide 
with the World Saxophone Congress that was happening in Bangkok that same year. So um, what we did is we went to Bangkok first, and then to several cities in China. Those were Shenzhen, Chongqing, and Dalian. That's what we played. Although we also visited Hong Kong and Beijing. Uh, very exciting trip. We managed to get uh, pretty much all the expenses paid through the help of the people in China, in addition to some of our winnings from that year in competition. So this is sort of a dream come true for us, and the first realization of a non-competition uh, but a performance career. Uh, the, the competitive thing is not very sustainable. You know, one day you win them all, and you know, what, what are you going to do for income or concerts after that? So this is our first taste of what it's going to be like to be a quartet in the future. And all I can say is travel is really hard, and it's going to be a big part of any ensemble uh, that's, that's aiming for a future performance career, I think. Uh, the touring ensemble, you're tired all the time. Uh, you're, in, you're in foreign places where they don't speak the language. You, you feel dependent. You feel like little children. If you're like me in, in China, you don't speak any English. Just You, you can't even... You can't even go get yourself breakfast. You know, utterly dependent, like a like an infant, on your friends and people around you that speak the language. Uh, so not quite the sort of glory and good times and, and life of ease and, and stardom that you might expect. It's it's a lot of uh, being chronically tired, being underprepared. Um, in the next year, one of the trips that we took, instead of our spring break, uh, we drove to Georgia from Rochester, which is about a thousand miles. We did a competition and several performances there. Then we drove to Philadelphia to do several more outreach performances. We drove to New York City to do some world premieres. And then from there to Columbia, Missouri to do another competition, the Plowman, and then back to Rochester. All in all, it was about, uh, I think, just shy of 4,000 miles of driving in under two weeks, about 12 days. And this is another example of, of the kind of reality of, of quartet life that we are beginning to see. When you do difficult things like that, you're trying to get a lot of music together, the more successful you become, the more music you're asked to play, uh, it clarifies your desire for that kind of a future. So that's what was beginning to happen. Some of us really loved this, and some of us really did not love it. And so that's the beginning of the end for Redline. Um, the rigors of travel and demands of the larger repertoires uh, decreased our tolerances for individual unpreparedness. That's, um, that's a big thing. So at a certain stage when you're just starting out, you show up to rehearsal and you don't really work on your part, it's not a big deal. But then it becomes a really big deal if this happens once the stresses accumulate, once you're getting paid to do concerts, once you have big opportunities uh, that you don't want to embarrass yourself for. Um, so pressure mounts up and um, sometimes that can get pretty uncomfortable. Uh, there is an increasing sense of the looming graduation for three of the members. Grad Graduating is kind of a time where you have to sort of decide what you're going to do. It's kind of an artificial time limit on a quartet, or, or not a limit necessarily, but a deciding point. So um, three, the other three members were entering their senior year, and as all of us who have graduated from undergrad understand, it's a very uncertain feeling like you've just flown off of a cliff, um, and you don't know what's going to save you. Staying in school and responding to our opportunities and successes became really stressful. Eastman's not an easy place uh, academically, especially for the undergraduates. We're beginning to miss a lot of class. Um, we were risking failures in those classes from the number of absences that we were tolling up, not to mention how hard it made uh, it to do the homework and sort of keep up with all of our obligations. So that stress factors in, and it colors your view of the experience that you're having in a quartet. It colors it negatively. So um, that's something to keep in mind as well. So. Um, with that in mind, we headed into our, our final year where we sort of reached the climax of our career. We still had a lot of uh, willpower, still had a lot of dreams. Uh, you know, I don't want to paint a totally negative image of where things were going. We had some problems to fix, and, um, and we certainly had some tremendous uh, victories in the year to come. Our remaining goals were to win a competition against a string ensemble. We wanted to learn to play more like a string ensemble, so we did a transcription. This ended up being Beethoven's 14 string quartet, Opus 131 in C sharp, which is hailed as one of the greatest chamber music works ever written. Uh, it's certainly one of the most challenging as well. And so we figured, you know, the, these people that we admire so much in their playing, they're, they're playing music that educates them. We want to learn to sound like them, and therefore we're going to play that kind of music, and we're going to try to do 
every bit as good a job as we'd expect them to do on it. And so um, that was sort of the Everestian feat of our fall semester in our third year. Uh, we devoted the whole semester to that string quartet and gave one performance of it. We never used it for competition, yet I believe it uh, hugely influenced the way we play together and had a lot to do with the successes that we had in our spring semester. We wanted to expand our repertoire beyond just saxophone quartet standards, even beyond transcriptions. Um, we wanted to do new music. We wanted to be part of the cause, so to speak. Uh, our CD remained unreleased, unedited, unmixed, unproduced, uh, undistributed. So there was a lot of work to do there yet to make sure we didn't waste some near $1,500 in the studio and, uh, and all the time and effort that that took. Um, and we wanted to move away from competitions. We're still going to compete, still going to do them, but uh, again, there's a thread here. You're starting to realize that you're running out of competitions and you don't really want to just compete all the time. Competing is stressful. It's hard. You sit there waiting for the results, biting your nails. It's, um, it's nowhere near as fun as playing for in concert halls for audiences that just want to hear the music, just want to hear your creativity, your personality, your art, and, um, and your camaraderie in it for each other. So we wanted to get into new music and more concertization. And finally, uh, we needed to figure out either how to survive as a career ensemble postgraduate. Uh, this is sort of the next level of credibility. I mentioned earlier that you establish a form of instant explosive credibility when you win a competition. The next level is do you stay together after you graduate or are you only together because it's convenient and you live in the same city? So um, the, the thing I started to notice is that presenters and, and big movers and shakers in the classical world are sort of waiting to see what happens to your ensemble when you graduate. Um, because a lot of ensembles split up. And to invest in an ensemble like that when they split up is a, a big risk if they don't know if you're going to stay together. Um, so to either stay together or to resolve our building tensions and separate amicably, which is what ended up happening. Let's talk about our final competitive victories. These were the North American Sax Alliance and Plowman. We won first prizes in each of those. The Sax Alliance was an important one because this is all saxophone ensembles playing for saxophone judges. So it's kind of a different angle. Uh, we used the money one in those to fund the rest of our CD production and finalization. And our largest triumph was the Chesapeake Chamber Competition. It's a huge victory, um, particularly because we were against our heroes that had inspired us so much in our first year, which were the Jasper String Quartet um, and the well-established Harlem String Quartet. And it was a $10,000 prize, um, really finished out a lot of our expenses for the CD and other things. And in addition, there are lots of venue representatives present there. It was, it was a big opportunity to play for the kinds of people that could help launch our career. And finally, uh, we finished up the year at the Alice Coleman competition in California. So um, the Backburner CD, which was released last year, this is the first Western Hemisphere recording of Maslanka's recitation book. This is an epic, wonderful saxophone piece based on uh, music of just Waldo and Bach. Uh, it featured a lot of popular appeal in the repertoire, as well as the purpose of documenting the music that we won the fish off with, um, which is perhaps the highest visibility chamber competition in the world. Um, also, the CD recently became available for digital download on CD Baby. Potentially, this is the only significant long-term impact of Redline Sax Quartet. I want to highlight this. We won a lot of competitions, and this is what's getting a lot of press and a lot of attention today. But you know what? Five years from now, there will be other people that win competitions and that fizzle or make it. The competitions don't really matter in the long run, in my opinion. It's uh, the legacy that matters. What do you do that sticks around? Um, if we're able to inspire other groups, then that sticks around. That's a legacy. Uh, this CD is the only sort of concrete thing that we have left after splitting up, except the commissions that we also did. So that's really important, particularly because it didn't take that much more effort to make the CD than it took to learn all that music. So um, just by following through, by sort of finishing the process, uh, we were able to do something really important with a lasting legacy versus something that would fade away and be forgotten. Um, the Powered Line concert was sponsored and uh, uh, curated by Baldinger Sekon II, a friend of ours in the composition department here at Eastman School of Music. Uh, it featured five world premieres for sax quartet and electronics. 
um, and this is one of the things that I'm talking about. That most of these composers, Baudinder, Andy, Robert, Andrew, and Matthew, they're all Eastman dudes, and uh, they wrote great pieces for us, really adventurous works, and it was, this was our, our main foray into what I talked about earlier, fulfilling the goal of becoming part of the cause, becoming an ensemble that didn't just um, run around and, and compete, um, but were, what were artists, were, were interested in, in music and repertoire and in getting away from competitions. And um, so that pretty much sums up our experience. And we come down to Judgment Day, which is graduation. That's really what pushes the issue. Um, new lifestyle priorities emerged in our third year, which changed some of our members' vision of their futures. These include the desire for security, uh, facing looming insecurity of graduating into no job, uh, new romances. We all know how these change our future perspectives. We want, uh, you know, when you meet someone special, it makes a big difference in your life. And to be honest, being in a quartet is a lot like being in a serious relationship. So often there's not room for two of those. Uh, disillusionment with a performance lifestyle. After a tour of China and uh, a tour of the eastern United States uh, and getting a taste of possibly what we're headed into, the more successful we got, the harder we had to work. The more music, the more travel, uh, the more expectation, the more pressure. And um, you know, not, not all of us enjoyed this. Uh, frustration with frequent stress. Like I said, whether the stress is coming from school or quartet or something different entirely, uh, you're spending a lot of time in quartet while you're stressed out, and uh, that colors your view of the situation. Uh, financial pressures and loan debt. Sometimes you got to get out of school and uh, start paying, you know, th those debts. And quartet, for all the time it takes, might not just be able to just might not be able to promise enough money and income right off the bat. Um, also, graduation was a convenient stopping point for us, a really nice place to sort of wrap up our victories and, uh, you know, we hadn't really gotten ourselves into anything we'd be in trouble for bailing out of. All the remaining gigs and obligations we carried out until the summer of 2010, and our separation was very friendly. I, I felt really good about that, a sense of, of true closure achieved. Uh, all four of us, I believe, were able to look back on a really positive um, educational experience that changed our lives. So um, conclusions, what to take away from Redline's experience uh, and what I, I hope to, that all of this means. So that's our narrative. Why compete? This is a big issue that uh, we run into a lot is, you know, the issue of competitions. Speed is the most important reason to compete. Speed in building your credibility. Speed in building your repertoire in, in getting your career moving. Preparing for a competition is an intense uh, urgent process that catalyzes a lot of musical improvement over a short amount of time. That's very effective and very useful. Winning the competition quickly establishes cachet for your group and um, is an important resume builder. It's not the only way, but they're accomplished more slowly uh, without a competition. So the reason I put this in there is that there are plenty of groups out there that uh, do not win competitions and are going to make it as stunning successful groups that go well beyond where Redline ever did. Uh, and, and it's as a result of these other methods of, you know, basically longevity. So uh, capital. Competitions when you're a new and young group, if you win them, can help give you money to do things in a sort of a quick way. It's sort of hard to get gigs unless you have that cachet already, sort of a catch-22 situation there. So um, if you can get a little bit of that capital uh, uh, stimulation there, then you can do more stuff. But watch out. Competing is extremely expensive. It's expensive for your time, for your spirit, and for your money. you got travel and things to do. We had a lot of help, like I said earlier, from the Eastman School of Music Professional Development Committee. So um, don't take these lightly. If you're going to do a competition, shoot to win uh, and, and do what's necessary. Make the full investment to do um, what you hope will get you the prize. Why not compete? Repertoire is the first thing that comes to mind. Often you'll end up choosing music that you wouldn't choose just because it's competitive or flashy. For example, uh, for me, the Beethoven String Quartet is one of the best and most epic musical satisfactions and challenges I've ever uh, had the opportunity to work on in my entire life. Would I like to keep working on it? Yes, but it's completely unusable for us in competition, so we only got one performance of, of it. And desire. If not all the members of an ensemble are down with competing, then don't do it. Because uh, the stresses of competition really, uh, they, they bring problems to the surface. And I've played in several quartets before Redline. 
uh, where that was the issue. And uh, doing your first competition can often break up a group where the desire just isn't there from all four members. So uh, don't go to just have a good time and see how it goes. Go to win if you're going to compete, or if you're not going to go to win, uh, my advice is do something else with your time and money. Uh, then there's the philosophical issue. Music as a competitive art, or a competitive sport, really. It's a questionable endeavor. It's something that we are always a little bit uncomfortable with. Uh, it can look bad to be seen as competitors and not artists, and that's certainly something that Redline suffered from in some circles. Uh, Competitions exaggerate the human triumph aspect of performance, the drama of a person or team of people stretching to their human limit, which, by the way, is similar to sports. If you look at the photographs of sporting that you'd see on the front page of New York Times, et cetera, it's always someone reaching, stretching, straining. Uh, that's the same drama that, uh, that sort of wins competitions. But does that distract from the composition or the art? So these are all questions that, um, you know, hopefully groups become comfortable with before throwing themselves into a competition. Um, I'm approaching the end of my presentation here, and uh, I have some random remarks. Redline today is well known for being active in competitions mainly, um, but the lasting impact will rest on the five new pieces which we helped get commissioned and the compact disc that we released. This is really important because um, these didn't take that much effort beyond what we would have done without them. Uh, maybe 5% more work in the big picture. But our entire legacy as an ensemble is going to be established by those things. Uh, in addition, a chamber music group is a highly intimate relationship. And uh, I've never been married, but from the people I've talked to, uh, it, I mean, I, I can't avoid the metaphors to marriage. It's long-term, it's emotionally charged, it's, it's about, it involves a shared passion, and um, you don't want to enter into one of these uh, thinking that it's going to be a light, casual deal. Um, if you play a lot together, spend 10 or 12 hours a week together, and go after big things, then um, you, you know, you're going to have to take care of each other like a family. Um, always to push. Uh, whether uh, conflicts with room bookings, uh, small things can often get in the way. And do whatever you can in a chamber ensemble to not let them slow you down at all. One example of this is let's say you have a rehearsal scheduled and then someone can't make it. Well, most groups cancel the whole rehearsal. I think one of the things that we did right is we just rehearsed anyway. And we found that even if only two people show up to rehearsal, you can get a ton of things done. In fact, things that you could not have gotten done um, otherwise. So, you know, we really capitalized and tried to make lemonade out of uh, lemons whenever we could in that sense. Uh, if you're in an ensemble, whether you're leading or following, return the energy. When someone throws out an idea or initiates a project with action, that's the leadership part of the equation. It's really important to bounce the same energy or higher right back. If you're not leading, you should be responding actively. Um, and this sort of uh, symbiosis there generates excitement. It generates uh, desire. And that's you know, what I keep pushing here is the desire for all four members. Marks of lasting success. Uh, longevity is the most important one. If a school-based ensemble has the ability to stay together after graduation, they're going to succeed no matter how many competitions they did not or did win. Uh, this is the most important thing, is sticking together. Again, uh, like many would say, like I would say, with a marriage, um, the ability to withstand significant changes in people's lives. They might move somewhere. Um, they might get married. They might have a kid. Uh, you, you name it, they might get hurt. Uh, but the ability to stay together, in my opinion, is the single most important feature of a successful chamber music group. Uh, competitions are not. Competitions are a means to an end. They help. They're a faster way. They're kind of a shortcut. But they're not the final answer, and it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, logistical ease. If a group can handle their logistics, communications, etc., then it's inevitable that you're going to sound good. Like I said, if you meet 10 or 12 hours a week, rehearse well, uh, you're going to do good. No matter how good the group sounds, if it's disorganized, it's going to fail and split. And finally, struggling to meet on time and communicate with each other is just isn't fun. It kills desire, and it damages self-respect. So logistical ease, avoidance of those problems, is a true mark of a lasting, successful group. Finally, cognitive consonance as opposed to dissonance. 
dreams, actions, and ideas should be in synchrony. Uh, I'm sorry, I, that should say dreams, words, and ideas should be in synchrony with your actions. Um, if you want to win a competition, it's no secret what kind of things you need to do. So uh, I see a lot of groups go do a competition but not prepare that earnestly for them or not, uh, not do the things that clearly win. One of them, the most obvious one, is memorize your program. Uh, this has been proven to be so effective, not just by Redline, but by them and other ensembles, that I'm still in shock that people show up to competitions without their music memorized, since um, the, the amount of work that that takes nearly guarantees you a better musical result, and it's so effective from an irrational point of view in terms of the effect, the overall effect on your judges and your audience that it has. That um, that's, that's a trump card that I don't understand why anybody would give up if they have the option to do it. All ensemble members should discuss their feelings and visions of the future very openly and frequently. That way, everyone has similar expectations and knows what they need to do. Um, desire, I keep coming back to this, the level of the ensemble member's desire is more important than their talent or advantages. Um, you know, talent certainly wasn't uh, equal. We, we had many differing strengths and weaknesses, both personality and playing in Redline. But sticking together and having the desire to make it all work out is what all successful groups end up doing. Um, I don't think anyone's just lucky enough to have a perfect combination. Uh, it tends to cause all the other things to happen just naturally. So um, that's the end of the presentation segment. I, uh, well, sort of a lot of things to get through there. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to open it up to the floor for any questions and discussion. I'm, I'm really looking forward to what everyone has to say. Well, thanks, Doug. Um, that was a incredibly thorough and uh, you know fascinating uh, look into Redline's story. Um, yeah, we we obviously I'm sure have some questions. We have a hand raised here from Rich Kleinfeld, so I want to see if we can uh, open Rich's line up so we can get his question. Rich, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi, Hi how Rich. are you doing? Hi, Doug. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to see you. Yes, and thanks for the presentation. It was um, very good, very helpful. Um, but there is that overriding issue of why the group didn't stay together. And I must say that um, this has been something that I'm very concerned about. Um, our group has been together for 35 years, and the group is more important than the members, in a sense. Um, I left in 83 and came back in 91, but started the group in 76, so they welcomed me back when there was an opening um, or asked me to come back. But, but what I'm wondering is where, if string players can do this, if string players can go to school and think in terms of chamber music and build quartets so it's just critical mass, ubiquitous, why can't saxophone players do it? Is there something wrong in the studio system that doesn't instill that in players? That Are they all thinking that they're going to be soloists? Because there is no other future unless you're in a quartet. Um, Rich, that's an excellent question, and um, I, uh, I look forward to answering it completely. For those of you listening, uh, Rich Kleinfeld, is, uh, he plays in the Washington Saxophone Quartet. Uh, which is near where I grew up, and is you've probably heard them if you've listened to NPR radio, so I'm really honored to have Rich on the program today. Um, my opinion on your question is that it's not that players want to become soloists, certainly not uh, our players. With our situation, people just learn this is not what they wanted to do. Um, you know, maybe when you perform, you realize, okay, my throat closes up, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I won't say who this is, uh, but he, it, was, it was very uncomfortable for him to perform. He, he got stressed out, and eventually he decided he just didn't like doing that. Uh, he decided to give up performance as a career goal altogether, not just uh, saxophone. And I think, you know, any kind of discovery of yourself like that that leads to doing what you really want to do is great. So um, this is part of the reason why we split up amicably, because in a sense it's a miracle that we were able to do any of the things that we did with, uh, with, with people that were unclear as to whether they wanted to commit their lives to playing the saxophone. Um, 
for me, I've sort of had the luxury of knowing that do or die, I'm going to play the saxophone. That, that's, that's what I want to do. But um, when you're an undergraduate, you don't necessarily know that. So with the string groups that stay together, um, you know, they, they sort of build a critical mass, like you said, or at least in my observation. But all four of them have a do or die mentality, usually. Let me point out um, the experience of an organization that I work with, Astral Artists in Philadelphia. Their mission is sort of a, they, they want to be the bridge between emerging talented artists and making it as a, a performance ensemble or soloist in the career. I've been on the roster of Astral since 2003, and one of the things that they frequently have talked about with me is that they, they get these string quartets that audition, and they're amazing. And they win, they get on the roster, and when you're on that roster, they invest tens of thousands of dollars into your career of attention, marketing, they have concert series, you name it, grants. And then something might happen like everyone in the ensemble goes and gets an orchestra job. Uh, they're all good enough. They all like each other, maybe. That happened in one particular case. That is exactly what Astral is avoiding, um, like the plague. And they've, they've gotten burns by that a number of times now, where uh, following school graduation, a group splits up that seems promising by all other respects. Or, um, you know, given the opportunity to all have a nice, secure, cush job in an orchestra, uh, you know, the, the, the group stops playing together. So this is something that, uh, this is the reason your question is why I pushed the desire uh, uh, button so many times during this. Uh, if you want to make it as a quartet or as a chamber ensemble, and that's, that's what you want to do, uh, then you need to find three other people that just want to do it, period. And then you'll succeed no matter what. And I, I think it's, that's my opinion anyway. Um, obviously, I, I don't know. I haven't been there. But... Uh, the other example is, is something interesting you, you bring up. Washington Sax Quartet's been together 35 years, and the group survives despite the rotation uh, or replacement of its members. Uh, this is what I was sort of hoping for for Redline. And actually, Redline still has a bank account open with that fifth part uh, sort of sunk into it. There's part of every CD that goes into the longevity of Redline. And I do have hopes of regenerating the group someday. But I have to replace three people. <laughs> so... Um, I'm sort of waiting until the right combination of talent and desire uh, comes up uh, the, the, for, for whom the, the model of Redline appeals to, which is engaging performances by memory of a variety of repertoire, not just contemporary and not just traditional. So uh, did that answer your question? It, it does, but I, I, you know, I have to say that there is this overriding um, difficulty with saxophone players being aware of their futures. In other words, uh, every other wind player who goes into a college atmosphere and studies and, and does whatever everybody does to become a fine player, um, they have some potential because it's built, it's inherent if you play a clarinet or a flute or something. There are lots of options. Right. But saxophone players only have that string, that sax quartet option, and if they, if they were taught that, if they if they learned that, then there'd be lots of players who'd want to be a part of it. And I and I wonder if if somehow that can be integrated into the uh, curriculum for sax quartet or sax players. Yeah, you know, I I agree, and and it's uh, it, you know, it, it of course it was a real heartbreaker for me. To, to have this group split up. You know, I, it, I think one of the things I brought up earlier is, is, is doing something like that really clarifies for you for or against. And for me, it definitely, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life if I have the opportunity to do it. I can't understand why anybody wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> but at the same time, i got to re respect uh, that you might not. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that's just part of the trouble of going... I, I, I think the, the source of that issue is you don't know what being a musician is like when you take on a music degree. You go to school, you do this music degree thing, being in school is a completely different experience than hitting the real world. You don't just build up for one big recital or, or two big recitals across your whole career right, and do the, that program once or twice. You do it 15 times. Man, uh, Backburner became one of our signature pieces. We played that at every single thing we did, you know. 
And um, I'm sure it's the same for great violinists. You know, if, if you know whatever piece or concerto they're working on, they they probably play it uh, 50 times. You know. Right. Well, you know, last thing, and I'll get out of the way because I'm sure there are other people. I hope anyway. Um, I talked to members of the Vim Quartet because they came uh -huh. to Washington here, and you know, there were similar things. They just needed to make a living. <laughs> So, you know, they, they broke up, unfortunately, because they were wonderful, too, as you said earlier. Well, I'll, I'll relate a, a personal anecdote of mine. After I finished my master's degree, I was, I was heading into the doctorate, but I, I had to have uh, some minor uh, athletic surgery over the summer. And after I recovered, I, I took a job waiting tables to earn some cash. I was trying to bartend, but this is at an Italian restaurant over near Webster called Basil. And I, I had such... A hard time at that job. I, I had what I call my quarter life crisis, uh, which is that I have a, a master's degree in saxophone, and I'm I'm waiting tables around people who don't like me, and and aren't nice to each other, and you know I, I had a really rough time in that environment. Why am I doing this? So I decided that I'm going to make cold calls six hours a day if I have to, um, to try to I have to earn my living making music. I just have to, and. By the end of the summer, I was making about the same amount of money <laughs> per hour, uh, which is which is a success. A success. <laughs> but what I'm saying that that's an example of the desire that I have uh, to do this that um, that I don't expect everyone to have. But if you're going to become a musician and you're going to go after a chamber ensemble, um, you got to make sure that that you're all on the same page. And in, in our case, we weren't. You know, I was on a much more committed page uh, than, than the other members of my group, and that's okay. You know, we keep in mind, we didn't choose each other. You know, it just, we were thrown together. So that's what I'm saying. It's amazing that we were able to do what we did with the circumstances that we had, um, and I'm, I'm really quite grateful for that. So, well, yeah. Keep it up. Keep your enthusiasm. Don't lose it. Thank you very much, Rich. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. We actually were very fortunate also to have uh, Sam Quintel from the Jasper Quartet on here, and I'm going to see if we can get Sam. Sam, are you there? Yep. Hey, Doug. How's it going? Hey, Sam. Great to have you. Thanks for uh, bearing with. It was a, it my... was a great, uh, great show, and thanks for the plug. That was great. Yeah. Um, I just wanted, I was listening to that last question, and I just wanted to sort of give the, the string player's take on that. I mean, Please. I, um, but but I, let me... Let, let me just introduce you a little bit more. Uh, Sam plays viola in, in one of my favorite string quartets ever. <laughs> and that's no underestimation. So if you can check these guys out, they're also new astral artists, um, and they're the nicest guys in the world. So um, they, their, their opinion is gold on this issue. So Sam, take it away. Oh, thanks. Um, well, I just, I just feel like, first of all, it was really interesting for me to listen to all of your sort of takes on forming an ensemble because I feel like you made a lot of the same realizations that we did and some different ones and some sort of slightly different approaches. But sort of in the general idea of, of what the difference or the similarities between, you know, forming a string quartet or forming a saxophone quartet, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of sort of luck of just finding a, a combination of people that works. And as you said, there's a huge amount of, of just commitment. But I feel like maybe one advantage that string quartets have is, is that there is an established uh, route to go. There's an established, um, you know, there's lots of concert series which are willing to have string quartets on, you know, without as much question as a saxophone quartet. It's, you know, there's, it's a more established genre and there's more repertoire. Um, but other than that, I feel like the 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 things that go in into a chamber group, or a string quartet, or a saxophone quartet are the same things, and they're the same challenges and the same benefits. So in a way, it's it's kind of interesting to hear the 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 view from the other side that it it feels. Um, especially challenging to, to form a saxophone quartet, which I find sort of sad because I feel like you guys are making music at the same level, if not higher, than any quartet. And it uh, seems like the support should be out there to, to make that a viable um, 
career and I feel like a part of the problem in keeping a group together is just the feeling that it's it's so difficult even more difficult perhaps than a string quartet to, to sustain that and to make a career out of them. Um, you know, those are some really uh, interesting thoughts. I, I totally agree with you. I, I think to tie that in with what Rich is talking about, I should say that in my personal opinion, Redline could have made it. We had every advantage in the world. I'm still turning down gigs and residency offers mm -hmm. for the group. <laughs> it really sucks. But, um, but we just didn't want to. And when I say we didn't want to, I mean as a group. You know, right. we, we didn't want to do that. that it's really okay. So the challenge is, is finding people who really want to do that uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of clarity. Now, one of the challenges of the saxophone quartet world is uh, f finding repertoire that's as heavy or weighty <laughs> as some of the, the war horses of the string quartet world. But one of the advantages that we have in saxophone is that saxophone's fresh. It's kind of a hip, shiny instrument. It has a uh, vastly popular uh, appeal. I mean, people right. don't know what a saxophone quartet is a, a lot of the time, and that can be a huge advantage. And I imagine, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that one of the challenges you guys face as a string quartet, is that um, to, to constantly redefine what it means to be a string quartet in a way that's fresh and, and t says to people, I know you've heard Guarneri and Emerson, but trust me, you want to hear us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you talked about having a signature that you guys play from memory and and something that sort of dominated our discussions over the last probably four years is figuring out something that sets us apart as a quartet from you know the thousands of other quartets that exist and have existed and so I mean in the same sort of process of, of discussing and finding something that is true to everybody in the group um, and also unique I think is it's been a long process and I think actually finding that partly involved actually being out of school and, and spending some time, you know, working without coaching and just really um, solidifying what we believe musically. But beyond that, like programming and, and uh, what sort of projects we're interested in, in pursuing and stuff, you have to find something that is, isn't put on, it isn't a show just to be unique, but something that you all believe in that is makes you apart from the others. And I think, I mean, that's a challenge with any group, but it's maybe a little bit more pronounced in the string quartet world. Yeah, I mean, the, the combination of uniqueness with authenticity is... Right, absolutely. Um, this is certainly, uh, yeah. So, Steve, do we have other questions? Thanks, Sam. That, that was a great, great uh, question and uh, response. Um, we actually don't, and we are well over time. But you know, that's always a good sign that uh, you know there's so much interest that we go over our time. Um, well, I don't know. So if it's, it's because I was too long-winded, is why. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is great. You know, all, all great stuff, and you know, things to think about with with chamber groups starting up and people trying to, um, you know, enhance their their existing groups, so just lots of fantastic information for everyone. Um, so I want to obviously thank Doug for a great presentation and taking the time to put this together and to think about these things uh, for the benefit of everyone. Um, and as I said, this will be recorded, it is recorded and will be up on our website so you can uh, pass the word to others, they, they can check this out. Um, again, that's polyphonic.org. And um, we hope you'll join us for next month's presentation on April 18th. That's going to be the same time, 8 p.m. Um, look for that information on our website soon. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to be um, Rose Bellini and Jim Holt talking about some really interesting um, issues. And um, we'll let you know about that soon. Um, thanks hey, again to everyone. Yeah, Doug. Sorry, yeah, but I just wanted to sort of tie up for the, the people who are in ensembles out there. Um, there's there's one final like sort of nugget that that I was that I'm excited to bring across, which is that there's there's plenty that Redline did not do well. We, we sort of stand as this example um, to a lot of younger students, and I, I want to just put out there there's there's no pedestal here at all. There's a lot of room to be improved on on our experience. So um, if you can walk away with just operating well, 
um, talk me about your desires, meaning that if your communal desire is just to read quartets on Saturday and uh, have a beer and, and play Nintendo games afterward, and all four people want to do that, that's a successful chamber music group right there. That's, that's as successful as it gets, is that um, uh, consonance between action and what you want to do together. So um, I, I, just, I just wanted to put that in there and, and stress how important I think that is from our example, that we didn't have that consonance. And anyone that does is going to um, have what I would call a more successful experience than even they think we did. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, excellent. So again, we'll we'll be in touch for next month. Uh, I want to thank Doug again for for joining us and uh, being our host and and everything. So uh, we will be seeing everyone next month. And again, if you have any questions or presentation ideas, anything, you can email us at info at polyphonic.org. Uh, thanks to everyone. And have a great night. Thank you. Yeah.